Today on the Lazy RPG Talk Show, we're going to look at Chris Perkins' latest DM Tips video and what it means to have opinionated DM Tips. We're going to cover two Kickstarters today, including the Level Up Advanced 5e Starter Set and a Kickstarter for a book called Monstrous, which looks pretty interesting. Today's big topic is going to be building a big situation and l making it really hard and letting characters get away with lots of stuff in that process. We're going to take apart an encounter I just ran this past week and look at it, how you can use that idea idea to build really fun encounters for your players. And we're going to cover more questions from the September 2023 Patreon Q&A all today on the Lazy RPG Talk Show. I'm Mike Shea, your pal from Sly Flourish, here to talk about all things in tabletop role-playing games. This show, like all of the work of Sly Flourish, is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. Patrons get access to the monthly Q&A, a dedicated Discord server, a whole bunch of tools and accessories to help them run their games, the City of Arches Sourcebook, Uncovered Secrets Volume 1 and 2, and a bunch of exclusive adventures, and a whole lot more. It's a really good deal you get a lot of really excellent stuff but most of all you help me put on shows like this to the patrons of sly flourish thank you so much for your outstanding support this past week chris perkins from wizards of the coast the lead story designer his title keep changing the titles of all the people there seem to change very often one of the main guys behind a fifth edition of DD and a dm for many big streaming groups and for acquisitions incorporated for a lot of years very very smart dude been working for wizards of the coast for decades i think and he gave a video, long video, 51 minute video covering a presentation that he had given now to a couple different places of his top DM tips. It is a really good video. I highly recommend watching it. It's got a lot of interesting stuff. It's very fun. It's very funny. And, and the tips he offers are really excellent tips. And one of the things though, that I thought was really interesting about it is that he many times throughout the video has multiple choice questions where he says like, here are, here's a situation and the situation he brings up are, are common problems that GMs have like having a person that's taking too much of the spotlight of the table or, you know, spending time on world building lots of different things that he, that are common problems. And he offers multiple choice questions like how you should deal with it and in, i'm going to spoil it in almost every case the answer is either all of them or almost all of them there might only be like one of them that you don't do and he's like these other ones you can do and what i think is really interesting about that is that is kind of the position that wizards of the coast is in with dungeons and dragons it is such a big role-playing game with so such a big audience and covers so much territory that there aren't specific ways to handle many circumstances and he's he's right there aren't a set of just perfect specific ways what's interesting is that other publishers other games other systems and people like me who write gm tips can have those opinions and that opinionated dm tips can sometimes be more useful when you sync with the person who has the tips i am very clear in return of the lazy dungeon master that i don't believe that all of the tips and advice and tricks and the eight steps and everything are sacrosanct in that book i don't believe they are the perfect set of tips for you to be able to run your game i think that they are they're, they're built on a lot of different experiences from a lot of different gms it's not just some idea i sat down and came up with these are these are things that many people have done for a long time they are built off of d hundreds to thousands of gms and the experiences that they have that, that pooled these up but they are still focused and opinionated there is a set of eight steps the steps are intended to be followed from step one to step eight as you're going through your prep they are some of them you can throw away some of them you can change out with your own steps but it isn't real fuzzy and i think that when we kind of offer a whole lot of different tips to cover the same problem we don't necessarily do service to it because it's like yeah but which one now maybe some of them resonate with you and you were able to kind of pick them and maybe you're like yeah now there's too many and i don't know which one you know i don't know which one i should go with or why which one is better over another so it's kind of an interesting position that wizards is in that chris perkins specifically what i you know one of the things that i think is interesting about this video is it probably is giving a good view into what the dungeon master what advice the the 2024 dungeon master's guide is going to have there's a lot of talk about what the mechanics of the game for the 2024 edition of D, &D are going to be like specifically because there's so much focus on character options which i think is important because you want to get the character options right there hasn't been any testing of the dungeon master's guide and i don't know how much testing you have to do of the dungeon master's guide because it's going to be maybe not an opinionated book 
but it's going to be a book of advice and you typically don't like test the advice or the advice is already being tested and has been tested for 50 years. So I think the Dungeon Master's Guide is going to be significantly different than the 2014 Dungeon Master's Guide. I am hoping people like it a lot more and that it follows a better model that GMs want. It's, it's pretty commonly accepted that the 2014 Dungeon Master's Guide has a really weird layout, a really weird way that it approaches the topic of DMing and that it hasn't served Dungeon Masters very well. It doesn't tell you how to do things. It doesn't offer ways to prep your game. It doesn't tell you how to build campaign worlds. Instead, it starts off with pantheons and money. And it's like, why is that going on? So it meant that people like me could write books like Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master to help give people a framework. And But honestly, I am hoping that the 2024 Dungeon Master's Guide does a good job too. It's not like I want them to screw up so that I get to keep selling my book. I want them to write a really good book. And I want that book to really help GMs because I think this hobby is really important. I'm also guessing that my style and their style aren't going to match 100%, which means there's still room for me to offer the kind of advice that I offer. But I think... What I find particularly interesting about that video is the idea that we each get to build our own opinionated set of GM advice and Wizards is not in the position to be able to do that. And you can kind of see that with the advice that Chris offers here. And it's really useful to kind of get a wide range of different ways. But eventually all of us sort of have ways that we think about our game, the things that help us, the direction we go. You know, I have moved away from worrying about like tactical, you know, building tactical combat encounters as a mainstay of my game, which I used to do in the fourth edition days, to now building little pools of stuff that help me improvise the game when I'm running it at the table. That's a big shift in how I've approached the game. But now I've been doing it that way for like 10 years and I really enjoy it. So, and I think it works really well and I'm, I'm happier. I'm, I'm happier running the games that I run these days than I was back when I was really focused on like the tactical combat encounter as the main component of a game and then linking to them together with a little sinew of story just to get them from one encounter to the next. I'm much happier. But I think it's really interesting. It is definitely a video worth watching. It's worth like writing down the tips and thinking about them and thinking about how they work. And then you can sit and say, which of these resonate best with me? Which of the ones help me run my game? Which are the ones that I can grab onto that are helping me with my problems? But I also think it's it, it puts wizards in a position where they have to provide a really wide range of advice for many different styles of of DMing. And I think that that's going to be a, a tricky spot for them to walk. It's been a tricky spot for them to walk all of this time. So interesting video. You can find a link to it in the show notes if you haven't seen it. And it's definitely worth, definitely worth watching. We're going to take a look at two Kickstarters. The first is the Level Up Advanced 5e Starter Set Kickstarter. This is by N-World Publishing. It is, it is now funded. It is a box set. This is, it's an interesting Kickstarter. And it is a a box set that includes pre-generated characters, three different adventures, and a guidebook that that connects your fifth edition game, your fifth edition books to level up advanced 5e. What I find interesting about it, and we'll see how it does, we'll see, we'll see, you know, kind of how it resonates and how it ends up working out in the end, is that it requires you to have the 2014 books. It doesn't expect it, it isn't a standalone product that this book expects you to have. It is a transitional product from the 2014 fifth edition D&D books to level up advanced 5e. Now you get some adventures with it. So that's really great. You get pre-gen characters, which are really great. You get a book that kind of talks about the difference and offers up some of the differences. But I thought it was interesting that they didn't make it a standalone product. Whether or not that resonates with you, if you if your idea is, okay, I want to see what Level Up Advanced 5e is like, and you already figure that you and your players already have the other books, then you can kind of drop this on top of your book. But but it is an upgrade to 5th edition, to core 5th fifth, fifth edition core, which I guess you could just grab the SRD as well or the basic rules and that would cover it as well. So you don't actually need those books, but most people are going to have them anyway. And I think that's their thought is that anybody that's going to buy this probably already has the base 2014 books. But I thought it was really interesting that it isn't just like a standalone. You buy this box and everything is inside the box. And you think with like a 66 page rule book, you could have done that for lower, lower levels. Although I actually think it starts at, at higher levels, but it includes poster maps. It's got cardboard tokens for heroes, villains, and monsters. That's pretty interesting. Like little, little pog kind of tokens, five pre-generated characters, 
and a three-part adventure path. So a larger adventure than you might normally have and a bunch of accessories that are more than you would have. But the one thing that kind of stands out to me is like, huh, that's interesting, is the idea that it is an upgrade to fifth edition, not a box that has everything in it where you can buy it, you can give it to people. I don't know. I mean, I feel like it means that you couldn't necessarily buy this and give it as a gift to people who have never played before and say, hey, you might like 5th edition, but you want, why don't you try this one instead? The Pathfinder 2E starter set is a fully con- contained box. Obviously, all of the different starter sets for D&D 5th edition are fully contained. It was kind of interesting that they decided not to go with a fully contained book. One other thing, though, that's worth noting is that this Kickstarter does let you order offset printed versions of the original a5e core books so if you've had trouble because they're a lot of times they're out of print uh if you if you want to get core level up advanced 5e books which i think are really outstanding i i I have all you know there's four books that i picked up the level up the 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 level up 5e monstrous menagerie trials and treasure i'm using mostly the gm books i haven't really delved into the player side of it so i have the adventurers book for it but i haven't really used it but trials and treasure and the monstrous menagerie i use regularly for rolling up treasure looking at different encounters obviously for all the monsters i use them as well but there are other books that you can pick up as add-ons including the dungeon delvers guide which is pretty cool so there's a lot of material that you can get here and you can get it in print and hopefully the shipping is a little bit easier to deal with because they're doing it at scale so it's a good opportunity to pick up all of their level up advanced 5e books which is the main reason that i wanted to bring it up on the show is i really like level up advanced 5e's books very much And I think this is probably one of the easier and better ways to get the offset printed versions of the books. You can also jump in and get the starter set itself. You get the three adventure paths. I haven't seen them. I don't know what they look like. And it looks like it's got some fun poster maps and it's got little cardboard tokens that that work as well. So worth checking out and a good opportunity if you want to dive into level up advanced 5e's version of 5th edition, which I think is an outstanding version of 5th edition. I'm very, I'm very happy it's out there. I use it Every, every time I'm using core monsters, I'm using monsters from the Monsters Menagerie instead of the Monster Manual. They're just, they're just better. I don't know what to tell you. The Monsters Menagerie is an outstanding book. It's my favorite book of last year. There's another Kickstarter called Monstrous that is out. Monstrous is a, a book about the stories of monsters. So instead of focusing on the stat blocks, it is giving you the lore. And what I really, it's got really, really cool looking art and it's got lots of descriptions about the monsters themselves. What I think is particularly interesting about this book is how this book might fit perfectly alongside Forge of Foes, the book that Scott Scott Gray, Teo Sabadee and and, and myself have put out, which will be available for general sale pretty soon, probably within a month. Not this month, but probably certainly within October and is going out to it's in printing. And I think it's printed. I, I, I have a feeling the printing is done and we're getting it ready to be shipped to distribution and, and get out there. Anyway, that book is coming out. But that book doesn't focus on the lore of monsters. It instead focuses on focuses on how to build monsters and run monsters in your game. But it doesn't have the lore. A book like this has the lore that you can use to dive into what these monsters mean, give you views of what these monsters are like, and then take the ideas from this, build your monster stat blocks using Forge of Foes, and then drop them on your table. Looks like a really interesting book. I backed the PDF version of the book to see it. So there's a preview you can get to on itch. You do not need to log in. You don't need to pay anything, even though it's like a pay what you want product. You don't have to pay anything if you're just looking at it to see, hey, is this a preview of the kind of thing I want to do eight page preview that shows you what the book looks like. Looks really cool. The art looks, look, art looks outstanding. Here's the lich, you know, really neat, very stylized, very stylized art and a good description of what they've got. They sort of have these like core abilities. You fill in the blanks and you can add bonus abilities, but it's not mechanics, right? It's, it's, it's just a touch of mechanics, but it's not full stat blocks. So it's a really neat way to kind of look at how to bring more lore to your monsters and how to sort of build monsters out of the way. But what's particularly neat, I think, is how well this book would fit along with Forge of Foes to help you build monsters of all different types. So looks really cool. I backed the PDF version of it. They did not reach out to me. I, I found this, I think uh, we had a patron who brought it up and said, hey, you should take a look at this. It fits well with Forge of Foes. And that got me to look at it and it looks really cool. So that's called Monstrous by Cloud Curio. And you can find that in the show notes. 
last week, I have a correction from last week. I was talking, I did my big rant about Counterspell. I got a lot of people who were like, ah, Counterspell's fine. Why are you, why are you hating on Counterspell? And that, like I said, hey, it's cool. You like it, then why are you, why are you worried about what I have to say about it? Like, if you're happy, you're happy. You don't have to listen to me. I'm not happy. I don't like Counterspell. But I, I did mention that I really liked A5V Counterspell, uh, level up advanced 5Vs Counterspell as an option. I do like it as an option. I think it's a, a, a good option on its own. Uh, but I made a mistake where I said that it lets you recast a, a spell of the same level as the original spell. It is It has to be equal to or less than half of the original spell slot. So the way that the counter spell works in level up advanced 5e is you make your check against the spells. If you're going to cast counter, you know, a wizard is casting a spell. You want to counter it. You would roll a spell. If it's second level or below, it automatically fails. If it's third level or above, you roll a spell casting ability check against it 10 plus the spells level you roll the check if it if you succeed the spell is countered and has no effect but the creature can use its reaction to reshape the fraying magic and cast another spell with the same casting time as the original spell this new spell must be cast at a spell slot level equal to or less than half of the original spell slot so you could theoretically cast like a cantrip certainly even if your first level spell is countered but if you counter like a fourth level spell that means you can then use your reaction to cast a second level spell what i like about this as opposed to the one that's in the 2024 DD one is this one doesn't steal the action from the caster the, the the 2024 version doesn't steal the spell slot but it does steal the action and i think nobody nobody on either side players don't want to lose an action and dms don't want their monsters to lose actions losing actions generally sucks so this is a cool way where the spell effect is countered but the action isn't taken away and instead they can use a reaction so they burn a reaction to do it but burning a reaction is okay and they can whip out another spell and do something if a huge powerful wizard is casting an eighth level spell and it gets countered they can whip out a you know whip out an ice storm or they can throw out a fireball instead if their disintegrate is countered they can use fireball that works for me like that means okay the spell and you still lose the spell slot so the idea that you don't lose the spell slot i think would make this too it would make counter spell too weak so yeah anyway i, I it makes me say that the, the the level up advanced 5e version of counterspell i like very much i think it works on its own very well and that's going to be i think for the time being my new house rule for counterspell i'll just say that's we're going to play it the way level up advanced 5e uses it and and i think people will be okay with it because it's a good spell so i just want to correct originally i thought that it was you could recast a spell with a reaction that's equal to the spell you cast which doesn't make any sense uh, but half the spell level makes a lot more sense. So I want to talk about today in kind of a, a, a bigger commentary. I want to talk about something that I ran in my Wednesday Empire of the Ghouls game. And it's a, a style that I've used that I really enjoy. And I, I wanted to kind of talk about it and dissect it and talk about how it worked in the game that I ran, but also talk about what the specific tips are that you can use for your game. And it essentially is has two factors factor number one is you throw the kitchen sink at your players that you maybe you go even twice as much as the deadly threshold when you're hurling monsters and put a lot of monsters out there a lot of dangerous monsters out there but then two, let your players get away with all kinds of crazy shenanigans so that instead of having like a balanced encounter but then constantly saying no you can't do that or they get a saving throw on it and then they don't have that instead you throw a lot more at them but you let the players get away with a whole lot more when they're dealing with the situation so let me give a specific example of this situation which was from a thing called the midden of the flayed it is an encounter that is part of the underworld layers book that came out with empire of the ghouls i was looking around for some inspiration for kind of things to do in between sessions of my Empire of the Ghouls game and I saw the midden of the flayed and I was like oh that's really cool and that actually fits well in the current scenario where they were going to this particular they're now going into the, the, the underworld and starting to deal with the Empire of the Ghouls themselves so this is a map of the midden of the flayed in the book Underworld Layers by Cobalt Press, I will link to that product in the show notes. And they call it like the butchery. And you can see it's like a great big pit. If you look at that middle map there, it shows you a side view where you have tunnels coming in. There's like a rope that connects two spots together. Then, you know, paths that take you around. And in this case, it's like a, you know, sort of a one, two, three, four, five layer, very vertical 
encounter environment, which is really cool. But I was like, ooh, wouldn't it be fun to build that in a 3D, very vertical Dwarven Forge setup? Five layers is too much for me. I really needed to do, I, I kind of condensed it down to three, but it still gave that, that, that view of what was going on. So the characters actually entered the midden by coming through one of the tunnels up above. And then it just dropped off into a great big pit that dropped 150 feet. The, the, this, obviously it's not to scale. So the drops between layers was not considered to scale. But it was like, you know, about, I, I think I tried to do it like within 60 feet from the upper platform to the stone bridge. And then like another 50 feet from the stone bridge down to the, the area below. And I, I wanted to have like this, you know, I figured like it's going to take, it actually took about a session and a half for them to explore the whole location. Maybe that's about a session because it was like half of one session, then half of another session to kind of explore the whole thing and deal with all of the things that were there. That were there. I inhabited it with a creatures called Bloody Bones, which are like these sort of semi-sentient, undead, slimy, ghoulish creatures that aren't quite ghouls. They're sort of like even lower than ghouls, but pretty powerful. And then I had a guy who was like dark cool shadow knight kind of dude who was sort of cast out he had he had committed some kind of atrocity for the ghouls and thus he was in charge of the midden of the flayed which is this great pit where they throw all of the refuse of the stuff that ghouls don't eat from people so it's like all they there there's this whole machine for eating sentient folk that the ghouls use all the remnants from that end up down in this terrible, terrible pit. So lots of different things. And of course, there's an Atiug at the bottom of the pit. In this case, it's a giant undead Atiug called like the, the Lord of Old Flesh that's down there. Really kind of neat and fun. But I wanted to set up this big environment. And then what I did is I threw like lots of creatures at him. So I remember that in the, in the second half, we had only four characters, four players. And I still had like eight or nine dudes out there. I still had a bunch of different dudes out there. You know, let's see. So here is like, you know, an example. Here's like a shot where you can see there's one character up above. Then a bunch of them are on the bridge. You can see down here are like extra creatures that they're fighting. Admiral Akbar is there to tell them that that it's a trap. That one of the players put Admiral Akbar into the situation. And you know, we kind of had these these great big fights. Let's see. Here's another shot. Yeah. Here, here's a big mosh pit, right? Like. <laughs> You know, here's here's like a whole bunch of guys fighting on a very narrow bridge with like a, I think it was about a 50 foot drop down into a big slimy pit with an Atiug that's more than happy to eat people that drop down there, including eating the bloody bones who got thrown down there. And this is kind of my main point is I probably had twice the deadly threshold. They were ninth level characters. So they're, they're powerful characters already. And I knew that because they're powerful, I don't have to worry about them falling a lot. I don't have to like that rope. I was like, no one's ever going to use that rope. If they don't have teleport and misty step and fly and levitate and a million other ways to deal with the verticality of this dungeon, I will be very surprised. Turned out they actually did use the rope that one, one character climbed across the rope and then used it to drop down so that he could land in a very particular spot. So that was pretty neat. So it gave options for people, but it really wasn't like the environment was not this sort of you know, punishing environment that was going to make it really hard for the characters. Instead, the characters knew like, oh, we can use that bridge. We can use the fact there's an Atiug below. We can use all this stuff. So my wife's character, Bruno, this this huge barbarian, bear folk barbarian, would regularly like attack and then grab a guy and then hurl him over his back and the bloody bones would go hurling down and land in the Atiug pit and the Atiug would eat him. Now, eventually the monsters started kicking the characters down there. So I think the worst situation was one of the monsters stabbed one of the characters, crit on it, knocked them prone, knocked them to zero and then kicked their zero hit point body down into the pit they land and take an immediate death save from the fall and then the Atiag is like ooh there's a great big juicy minotaur to eat and started going over to the minotaur and the player's like oh. and I said like the, the, the Atiag picks up the character and hangs it over its mouth and is getting ready to bite its head off and they're like we gotta stop that so they had an entire round to kind of deal with that situation which I, I think works really well when you put when you threaten a character's life when you put a character in a situation where like the final blow is going to be dropped, I like to give them an entire round to deal with that situation. I like to, I like to tell them it's going to happen 
And then they have one round to kind of get that person out of that harm. And it means they have to, a lot of times they have to break away from optimal choices. They have to like take opportunity attacks. They have to use their actions to try to throw healing potions their way. They have to do other things in order to try to deal with the danger of the situation. But the main idea is that when you build a really kind of interesting environment like this and you throw a lot of, let's see, here's another now, here, here, here the Atyug has lots of the sticky tack, by the way. You want to trick blue sticky tack along with like the three by five card is one of like the absolute best tools for a DM who has a lot of scenarios like this because you can use blue sticky tack to tack creatures onto other creatures. So, oh, I want to ride the dragon. Great. Little blob of sticky tack, stick it to the monster, stick the, stick the character to the monster, and now the character's riding the monster. In this case, it was the monster deciding who to eat. Do I eat the Minotaur or do I eat our hedgehog person? Who who am I going to eat for? Look, everybody's everybody's down on this one. There's I, I, I can't tell that. Dwarf almost looks like he's falling. Isn't that wild? I don't think he is falling. I think he's he's I think he's lying on that. Oh, he's on the bridge, right? That's the bridge right there. And he was the one that <laughs> he hung from the rope and then dropped down. I said, it's like a 50 foot drop. He's like, I'll take it. And so we rolled like 5d6 and he, he was like, well, can I, I forget. He had some reason like, could I try to make a saving throw? And I was like, sure. And he made the save. And I said, you make the save, but you do land funny on your ankle and you hear a popping sound and now your ankle hurts. And you're like, it's going to take three days before that pain on the ankle will go away. You know, again, doesn't hurt your movement speed, but you know, you know, and I know that you have a strained, a strained ankle. And so he dropped down, but he landed prone. And then he was there to try to, he has a teleport gun, which is hysterical. He can shoot a person and instead of doing damage by shooting them, he instead teleports them to another spot, which is fun. Although I think he switched his class out when he lost his soul. All their souls are gone, by the way. They, they, they gave their souls up in order to be able to go to the Underdark and not have every undead on the face of the planet go get him. So really, really a fun situation to kind of throw the kitchen sink at the characters, but give them lots of options to do things like hurling them down into pits, sicking one type of monster against another type of monster, you, using the environment in really creative ways. And you don't have to define all of the ways that the players can use the environment. You just want to set things up. You kind of look at it and say, okay, I know that there's a 50 foot drop, so we'll see. And just expect that the characters are going to be able to deal with it because a lot of times they are, particularly when you cross like seventh level. Once the characters get to like seventh level and fifth edition, they have so many resources at their disposal. You can usually just throw tons of stuff at them and they'll find a way to deal with it. It's still a real challenge, but they'll find a way to deal with it. So that was something I wanted to share. I think it, it, I think it worked out really well. It was a really fun encounter. The other part was like the exploration of it. They, they met a Darrow who was speaking strange sermons to a bunch of starving ghouls because he couldn't quite escape from them. He was really weak and he didn't want them to eat him. So he was doing these sermons and then the characters discovered that he had survived the fall and, and ended up in this pitfall ghouls and then chaos, chaos incurred and they managed to save the Darrow. The Darrow, they needed to save the Darrow because the Darrow knows the next location that they need to go to. But that was a lot of fun. And again, it was all like, so we had a lot of role playing. We had a lot of exploration and a lot of combat all in one big environment, which is a lot of fun. It lasted a good three hours for us to, to enjoy for our game. But most of all, it was like, I mean, I'm always talking about the idea of setting up situations and letting the characters navigate the situation how they want. But there's also something to like throwing the kitchen sink and then letting them get away with a lot of shenanigans. You know, one of the characters has a grapple gun and right off the bat, he would like shoot a, a, a bloody bones with a grapple gun. You know, I would say roll an attack roll. He would hit the guy. The guy would go zipping up and like winding around as he would zip up and then he'd cut the rope and the guy would go falling down. And I was like, sounds cool to me, right? Like that, that sounds like a good time. And they use that grapple rod all over the place. And I was, I laughed and I'm like, you know how overpowered that grapple rod is? Like, I know. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, you know what else is overpowered? Me, because I can throw as many monsters as I want at these characters. So I thought that was a really fun situation and I'm, I wanted to share and I hoped that, I hoped that that was something that was valuable to share and give you guys ideas about how to kind of, you know, make life hard for the characters, but then let them get away with lots of stuff, I think is a really a, 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 a valuable and a fun thing. And the players love it and you love it. You, you, you don't feel bad when your monsters are getting hurled into a pit because you're like, I had lots of them. And the characters, the players particularly, enjoy getting away with stuff. And this is a way for them to get away with stuff. 
So all that Dwarven Forge stuff is cool, Mike, but I don't have Dwarven Forge. I don't want to buy Dwarven Forge. It takes up too much space. It takes too much time to set up. It certainly costs a lot of money. So that doesn't help me at all. Well, I've got a solution for you, which is called the Dwarven Forge Virtual Tabletop Backdrops. This is a feature for Sly Flourish Patreons. Patrons of Sly Flourish get access to this. It is a Google Photo library filled with Dwarven Forge setups with no creatures on them that are transparent. They're transparent pings that you can drop into your virtual tabletop of choice to be able to use in your own games online. I use them when I'm running games online and I happen to build a Dwarven Forge setup for it. I will use them in my online game using Albert Rodeo. I'm going to show you how to do that. But you can also use them if you're in your in-person game, but you use virtual tabletops for things like a screen on the table or a monitor that you share or something like that, you can show that off. So one of the things that I do, and I did it for these, is I created these, these backgrounds. They're transparent, so they look really nice when you drop them into your virtual tabletop. And I did the Mance of the Flayed. So you have a whole view that's got all three layers. You could even use it just this way with all three layers, but then I broke down each layer so that we have like individual rooms. This is like layer two. You can see layer two. So this is layer three that has the upper hall. This is layer two that has the middle hall. And then of course I have just the bottom tier. So if you really want to be able to get in there and not have some of the upper layers burying the lower layers, I have five different transparent backgrounds for each of those layers that you can drop right into your virtual tabletop of choice. What does that look like? How does that work? So you drop the image. You can download all the images from the Google photo library when you're a patron. So you get access to the link by being a patron of Sly Flourish. You can download all, there's about a hundred of them now, a hundred different tabletop backgrounds you can drop. You can download all those backdrops and then you can add them as maps to Owlbear Rodeo. So I added one in, for example, into Owlbear Rodeo right here. I decided to use the, the, tall, the top view because it's kind of fun to have the 3D nature of it. And here you can see, you can drop little tokens on for your bad guys. You can move them around. Here's like an evil wizard that's in the back. Here's a couple of our characters. There's a bard here, some kind of knight here. There's a fighter up here who might be up here with a bow shooting down on these other guys. And then, of course, down below, you have like an Atiug that's lurking in the pit. So you that's, you know, it, it, it works great. And even though it's like an isometric view and it's not a perfect top view grid, let go. Don't worry so much about the grid. You can, you can just move characters. You can even see how many squares one thing can move. You could say like, oh, you're back here. One, two, three, four, five takes you right up to the edge. Or, you know, you want to get across It's one, two, three, four, five gets you there. So you can still kind of figure it out. The distance calculator can still work. You can use like the little ruler to say like, how far does this go? You know, you get about halfway across the bridge is 30 feet of movement, stuff like that. So it still works, even though it's an isometric map. And actually it being an isometric map, makes it look really fun and really cool. I really dig this idea. So it's all actual physical models set up using Dwarven Forge that you can download as transparent backgrounds that you can drop into your virtual tabletop. It works in all of the virtual tabletops of choice can, can do this. It's best if you shut off grid snapping and you shut off the display of the grid. That won't work really well. You can shorten both of those off as we have here and things work really well. It's, it's a lot of fun. I've run it with my players, my players. I've run virtual games where we use these Dwarven Forge setups with my players and my players really enjoy it. So that is just one of many, many, many features that you get for being a patron of Sly Flourish. Again, the link to become a patron is down in the show notes. You can get access to these virtual tabletop backgrounds, but you also get tons of other stuff, including what we're going to do next, which is this Sly Flourish Patreon Q&A. Every month, I put up a new thread on Patreon, on the Sly Flourish Patreon, asking for people to ask their questions about tabletop RPGs. I answer every question there on Patreon. Some of those questions I bring forward here into the show. We talk about them on the show. Some of them become the catalysts for other articles or other videos. So let's dive in. Graham D says, how does your game... How does your game prep vary when preparing to run a published adventure, specifically with room or encounter descriptions? Do you just have the adventure open in front of you? I was thinking about this when you were criticizing Scarlet Citadel for its verbose room descriptions. Do you add some notes to your eight-step document, perhaps under potential scenes? I am visually impaired, so basically always have so basically always have to make abbreviated notes for myself, and I'm always looking for better ways to do for, for of doing things. 
So two good questions. And one, one the, 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 the fact that you are visually impaired is something that I wanted to talk more about too, because I wanted to offer resources for other GMs who also have are visually impaired. There are numerous resources out there for people to use for if you have, if you are visually impaired or, or completely blind to be able to play tabletop role-playing games. I think it's really important. And I'm going to share, I'm going to share a few of those. I have to go dig them up. Then I'll go share them. But the answer to you with Scarlet Citadel is, yeah, I typically like to have the book in front of me. I don't want to recreate what's in that book. That's one of the reasons I bought it. So I prefer to have books. And obviously this was one of my big criticisms of Scarlet Citadel is that I prefer to have an adventure book that I can have in front of me at the table and use during the game. And if it's too wordy, I can't really use it because I can't parse three, four, five paragraphs of text while I'm running the game. And these books are big. They're 160, 180, 240 pages. They're big books. So it's not like I can memorize everything that's in there. And I don't like the idea that I have to go into a book and summarize it myself. There's no reason the book shouldn't have summaries in it. So yeah, I I typically want to have the book open in front of me. I mean, even Empire of the Ghouls is not exactly like it's got everything down to these like super specific bullets. But I still find that one easier to read, easier to parse, and easier to use because it covers more territory in the same amount of words that Scarlet Citadel used lots of lots of words for for individual rooms. So Graham, one of the other things you brought up was you know like which steps do you use when preparing a published adventure? And I actually have an article where I talk about the idea of choosing the right steps. Which steps do you want based on the type of adventure you're running? The difference between a one shot adventure and a longer campaign or a continuing campaign or a published adventure or a homebrew adventure will depend on which steps you actually want to have. So this article, which you can find in the show notes called Choosing the Right Steps from the Lazy DM Checklist hits on that topic very specifically. Regarding being a vision impaired dungeon master, there are some good resources available for people who are blind or people who are vision impaired that want to run tabletop RPGs. I'm going to link to a whole bunch of these down in the show notes, including like a how-to for blind and low vision tabletop enthusiasts from Cool Blind Tech that talks about different ways, ways you can modify your system, modify the kind of game that you run in order to help being afraid. I have a player who I play with regularly who is blind. And so we're familiar with things as one of the reasons why I run lots of theater of the mind combat is because having a detailed battle map is not really useful to people who can't see. But there are, this is why theater of the mind is not only do I think theater of the mind makes the game more fun, but it is also better for accessibility. So the easier it is for us to run theater of the mind combat for the players to run theater of the mind. Now, of course, you also have players who have aphantasia where they cannot necessarily visualize in their head the way a scene is working out without seeing something. So what can you do that can support kind of both styles is a good question. But that's why I, one of the, it's one of the reasons why I focus a lot on theater of the mind combat is because beyond, in my opinion, it focusing more on the action and the adventure of the story, it also is more accessible. There is a Discord server called Knights of the Braille. I have a link for that. This was recommended to me from other dungeon masters who are visually impaired or blind when I was asking. I, I've gotten emails from people who say, hey, I'm, a, I'm, I'm blind and I'd like to be a dungeon master what can i do and i'm like i don't know i'm not you know <laughs> this is not my specialty however i do have the ability to reach out to lots of people and say hey what are some good resources and these are some of the good resources that have come back to me for for people who, for blind or, vi- or visually impaired gms and the knights of the knights of the braille discord server are a bunch of other blind or visually impaired dungeon masters that get together to talk about what tools and technologies and techniques they use for it there is a there's also a magazine called Accessible Gaming Quarterly. Uh, you can find that, again, links down in the show notes, that offer features and tools and, and techniques for running games. It's a sort of an online zine, I think. I haven't, I haven't checked it out myself. I haven't opened it up to see exactly what's going on there. But it's generally a magazine that talks about accessibility and gaming that can be really important. There's also a service called All May Read, which by the National Library National Library Service for the Blind and, and Print Disabled from the Library of Congress, and they have D and D core books available, either I think in Braille or in in speech, that you can you can kind of reach out to them and say, hey, I want to get access to these kinds of things. So those are just a few of the resources. I would definitely jump onto Knights of the Braille and talk to other people there and get ideas about ways to improve it. I did receive email from other blind or visually impaired dungeon masters, one of which had built basically an entire system in Excel. They they apparently Excel is really good with screen readers, or for this particular person was really good at screen readers reading and because of the way they use screen reading they were able to kind of put a lot of information about monster statistics and monster stats and player stats and other things that they needed in excel and then use excel 
to navigate through it and find the information that they wanted to run. But there's definitely some tricky bits, like the idea of how do you manage monsters? Like it's one thing when like the players can help you a lot. People, you know, players who, are, who, who can see can help you with a lot of different things. But not if you're trying to hide things from them, too, because you don't want them to learn the story. So like monster stats, you wouldn't necessarily want your players to have all of the monster stats. So how do you manage monster stats? That's some of the tricky bits. But I would recommend all those. Again, I'm going to have a whole set of links in the show notes for visually impaired dungeon masters and, and some resources that they can find that you can find to help you run your help you run your games. Kevin D says, do you have any suggestions for using recaps at the start of a session, particularly in combination with strong starts? My gaming group is just my wife and daughter, and we tend to play sporadically, sometimes twice in a weekend and sometimes once every two months. Using some of your advice, I've been tracking our sessions using Obsidian, so I have the high points of the previous sessions, but I haven't hit on a good way to work these in without it feeling like a bullet list. I've considered doing a cinematic recap, like the pre credit scene on a recent shows like The Mandalorian or similar, but it hasn't come out well in my solo practice. A give yourself a break you don't have to be perfect we don't we're, we don't have a writing room full of writers who are able to write the crawl text at the beginning of our thing so it will be fine you don't cat look at this look at this guy he's like i want to get involved what what do you want go away cat's like I'm, i have things to say about this question don't fret about being perfect too much ums and uhs and jokes and missing up messing up names and not saying things perfectly is totally fine that's just that's how gming works the idea that everything needs to be this like perfect text is not great it was interesting when i talked earlier in this show about the dm tips that chris perkins talked about he talked about his process of the things he needs in order to run a game and it broke down to three things which i thought was really interesting and one of them was a recap of the previous session that he likes to recap the previous session write it out and so he has like almost a script written out for the things that happened in the last session. It lets him highlight what's important. It lets him you know, set the stage of what's going to go. It's sort of his version of a strong start, maybe, but it's, it's his way of getting both his head and the player's heads around what happened, focusing on what's important. I thought that was a really interesting idea. I haven't really tried it, and it's probably more work than I really want to do to try to write it up in a really neat and neat paragraph. But you might try something like that. The other one is I often try to work with my players and all of us together kind of recap where things went. I'll, I'll ask the players to start. I say, who would like to describe what happened in last session's game? Usually one of the players jumps in. Sometimes it's particularly... And, and this is something where, you know, if you can kind of your players or at least one of your players to take notes of what happened in the session, even if they're just doing bullet lists and, and bullet lists is totally fine for taking notes when you're playing in a game. That's what I did when I was taking notes when I was playing my game is then then it rewards them for having done so they get a, they know that they have a benefit of the, the, the notes that they took they can use. And even in, and then if they share those notes, and even if they're not there, somebody else can read their notes and say, oh, yeah, that's right. That's what we did. And then you can fill in some of the important points to make sure that just everything is staying generally on track with what, why they're doing what they're doing, what's going on. So that's probably my big recommendation is ask your players, one of your players to volunteer to take notes it can be very brief just bullet lists of what happened during the game if they if you don't think they're doing it ask them like hey you, you know you might pressure a little bit like hey are you still keeping up with the notes this sounds like an important thing you know kind of do what you can to make sure that they're keeping their notes and staying off their phones and then at the beginning of the session ask them to recap the game that's what i do and again it's not you don't have to you know the most importantly is don't worry about trying to be perfect but i did think it was interesting of chris perkins's way of him spending a it sounded like a good chunk of his prep time writing that recap uh the other things that he did is he kept a list of npcs both villains and friendly npcs and he had a map and those were like his three things for prep i thought that was a little thin i would need a little bit more than that and and you know but it was neat it was neat to hear somebody else's like here here's the outline that i do and i'm like oh that's cool my outline is different i don't have i don't do a recap i ask for a recap but i start with a strong start where where is the game going to begin what's going to set this game off and, and and get it pushing forward so that was really interesting phd20 says how can game masters bring more energy to their sessions and therefore hopefully to the players exercise eating eating right eating the right foods avoiding carbs uh, right before or during your game and, and sticking to high energy foods that are going to, that are going to keep you going. There's a lot of physiological things we could do. Standing up, uh, you want to bring more sessions to your game, push the chair away and do it standing up. You can sit down from time to time, but st when you're, when you're talking about the game, when you're into it, talk to it. I had a fun thing where 
because we had fewer players, I had a whole side of my table, which meant I could walk back and forth on the table. And that was actually kind of fun. I did, I did a fair bit of that. So physical stuff is important, right? Physical energy. If you can, if you have the ability to, to set the time of the game when you are going to be at your best can help uh, both you and your players. Like my Wednesday game is lots of fun, but it's seven and seven to 10 on Wednesday nights after a work day and people are pretty tired right now. You know, we do a lot of fun, but it, it's definitely a more somber game than my Sunday game, which begins at noon and goes till three noon to three. People have usually had a little bit of a bite to eat and they're fired up and it's not, you know, it's not nap time yet. But those, those are things that I think you can, you know, it's pro- may not be what you're asking for, right? You're probably like, no, I meant in game. I meant like what the things in game. Other things though, beyond, you know, go for, go for a walk or right, exercise and go for a walk, get a good night's sleep, drink lots of water, eat the right foods, all the things your doctor tells you to do that none of us do, right? Those are all things that, that will help bring that energy to game, stand while you're running the game. But then in the game itself, so some other things that can help you are like really focusing on the cool part of the game. What What's the part of it that excites you? Even if you're running a preset module, you, remember, you have the full right to change it however you want. Is there an aspect of the module that you're like, that part of it is really cool. When I was running Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, I wasn't crazy about the adventure. But one of the things I hung on to is like, this is the cool part. This is what I like was the whole Netherese part of it. The whole idea that there's Netherese ruins out there that's buried under the ice. And now that, you know, the ice is changing, that the Netherese ruins are coming out. That part I thought was really fun and really cool. And I liked hanging on to that. When I was running Descent into Avernus, it was also not necessarily one of my favorite adventures. Adventures, but I really like the path of the Hell Riders. I like the idea that there was these knights that were loyal to Zariel that went with her into Hell and that got corrupted. And some of them embraced the corruption and became these horrible devil type beings. And some of them were repressed and they knew that what they had done, that they were cursed and they were wrong. And then some of them fought against it. And, and that was what I really enjoyed. I love the idea of the story of the Hell Riders and the corruption of Zariel being told through these individual knights who were like the closest knights to Zariel. And all of them kind of took a different approach that like some of them were just side by side with her and would fight with her regardless of whether she be, was a devil or whether she was an angel. It didn't matter. They were still fighting demons no matter what. And she, they were 100% lockstep with her. Then other ones were like, had accepted it, but realized what they had done was wrong. And then other was, would not accept it. They were thrown, they were they turned into a vampire and thrown on a big spiky tree and forced to starve to death in, in the middle of hell. So that part of it excited me about that adventure. And that was the thing I hung on to and I ran with and I really enjoyed. So I think that as a GM, when you look at the campaign you're running or the adventure that you're running, try to find the parts of it that really are the parts that excite you. Double down on them. Think about it like you're 13 years old again and double down on it. Like, how do you turn that up? How do you how do you focus more of the game on that part of it that's really kind of fun and cool and interesting? And 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 stick with that. So all those things. Take care. Take care of your, you and your body is very important. And also finding the part of the game that is the, the thing that excites you the most, because that excitement is going to be contagious with your players. I think I think that that really helps. Bill R says, inspired by playing Baldur's Gate three, my f- my work friends want to play tabletop D and D once more per month, once per month with me as a DM. Awesome! I'm I'm really interested to hear if Baldur's Gate three brings a lot of people to the TTRPG. I really hope it does. I think it could. I think that that could be a, a new sort of influx of new players into this game. It's coming at a weird time because we're like between versions and everything like that. It kind of doesn't matter, I guess. But like. We might see an influx. So for those of us who are deep in the TTRPG industry, it helps to bring people in. Don't push them away. Don't talk about how the game is different. Don't say, oh, that's not really. Don't don't build walls, man. I'm telling you, don't be one of those guys. Find new players. Bring them in. Teach them the game. Show them why it's fun. Buy them a starter set. Let them play how they want to play. Let them bring in Baldur's Gate 2, 3 stuff into the game because it's fun. Don't, don't be a, what do they call it? Don't be a gatekeeper. Right. Don't don't force them out. It's I don't know why, but we kind of want to do that. We're like, I got my tribe and I don't want new people coming to the tribe too easily. Don't be one of those people. Let them in. Let this this hobby is awesome. It's too awesome for us to just hang on to it ourselves. Let's bring it to everybody that we can. So be cool. Be cool with the new people coming in. 
My work friends want to come and be a DM. They are casual D&D players, so I think I should run just basic 5e adventure that can reliably deliver a decent three-hour game once per month. Would you recommend Fandelver, the Dragon of Ice Briar Peak, or Shadowkeep on the Borderlands, or something else? Lost Mine of Fandelver is great. I haven't looked at the new Fandelver Obelisk book, the new hardcover adventure, but that might be a really good starting adventure because it goes for a while. It's like up to 12th level. The Shattered Obelisk, right? So the Shattered Obelisk begins with Lost Mine of Fandelver and then expands out from there. I haven't dug into it too much, so I don't know how great the other half of it is. But I know that Lost Mine of Fandelver is a fantastic adventure. I've run it many, many times. I love it. It's really good D&D. So that is certainly fine. Dragon of Ice Spire Peak is also really good. I recommend that. Don't forget Dragon of the Stormwreck Isle. This is the new adventure that came out in the most recent starter set. I think it is probably the most user DM or new DM friendly adventure. It doesn't sound like you're necessarily new though so i don't know that you need the same kind of training wheels that that adventure has but it's still a really fun adventure i ran it and it's as good as any DD adventure i've run i really liked it so that i would recommend of course i would be remiss if i didn't recommend sly flourish's fantastic adventures there's a whole bunch of different adventures for first to fifth level characters they're all very straightforward people really love them it's been been around that book has been out for a while now and people really like that adventure ruins of the grander root is very near and dear to my heart also very popular and has adventures for first to fifth level characters starting around Deep Delver's Enclave. Both of those books have free first level adventures that you can just download and, and pick up. You can try that. If you're looking for something a little shorter, you can pick like Caves of the Cockatrice, which is one of the free layers that we have as part of Fantastic Layers. That's also available. These are all books that I've written, written with James Intercasso and Scott Gray. And we have made many of them available, parts of them available for free. So you can try them out. You can see them. You can download maps. So they're all very user friendly. So those are the ones I'd recommend my own plus the three starter set adventures but i think that that is where i would go if i was running a three-hour game for new players but take a look i so i i take a look at the reviews i need to dig into it i just haven't had a chance to dig into shattered obelisk to say is the latter half of the adventure really interesting and cool i'm not sure i, I haven't heard anything that says no it's not cool but I, is it as good as everything that's happening in lost mine of Fandelver? hard to say Rich G says you're running a three hour intro game for new players. What published one shots do you run? Just see the answer. See the answer that I just gave to Bill R in the previous one. I'm going to combine these together. So these two questions are together because they're the same, right? I, I think Lost Mind of Fandelver, Dragon of Ice Spire, not, not in any order. This isn't a rank order. Any of these I think would be good ways to get started with some, some good fun D&D. Lost Mind of Fandelver, Dragon of Ice Spire Peak, Dragon of Storm Mech Isle, the Nightblade, which is available for free for Fantastic Adventures. You can find it on the site where you would buy Fantastic Adventures. There's a link to a character, big character pack that comes with a bunch of pre-gen characters and a free sample adventure for the Nightblade. Likewise, Call of Star Song Tower, available for free, uh, meant to be an intro adventure that makes it very easy to play, meant to be played in a pretty short period of time. Small dungeon delve where you go into an old ruined tower, fight some monsters and get yourself a little lair that you can do. Beautiful map by Elven Tower that belongs in here and available completely for free. So those would be my recommended, my recommended adventures for uh, getting started with D&D and showing new people how to play. Friends, I want to thank you all for hanging out with me today while we talked about all things in tabletop role-playing games. If you enjoyed this show and you want more stuff like this, you want to see other things that I have made, other things that are available, other things I've produced, please subscribe to the Sly Flourish newsletter. It is the best way to stay in touch with all of the work that I do. You get a free weekly RPG-related email sent directly to your inbox, plus a free adventure generator PDF. That email that you get every week has links to all of the other things that I do. It's got seven D&D tips every week. It's got links to videos and podcasts and other things that i've made all of that is available in that in that newsletter special deals on on sales on other products and things like that you can of course join the patreon i already showed off things that that the vtt the dwarven forge vtt backdrop is just one of like literally more than a dozen different things that you get by being a patron of Life flourish it's a really good deal you should check it out and of course you can pick up any of my books including fantastic adventures ruins of the grendel root fantastic lairs Return to the Lazy Dungeon Master, Lazy DM's Workbook, Lazy DM's Companion. You can pick up all of my books available at the Sly Flourish Bookstore. Links for all of that are in the show notes. Thank you so much. Have a great day and get out there and play a role-playing game.